there is no other question so we can continue the lecture so today i think it's going to be one of the uh, easiest lecture you will see like most of the concepts we have already covered in the lecture before and it's just maybe you can say a, a, a revision of that and i think mainly two important concepts we will uh, discuss today the first is kernel trick which we will see how it's used for svm and the second is uh, softmax activation so these are the two uh, new concepts otherwise everything else uh, we have already covered okay but still if you have any questions uh, do let me know so last time we were talking about max margin classifier and support vector classifier and we saw like they are almost similar the only difference is max margin uh, we make sure that there is some minimal margin between the uh, uh, the support points or the support vectors but in sv classifier we do relax that and we do allow some points to cross the boundary now the next question was what if we don't have a linear boundary which is actually the case in most of the real world data sets we won't have that clean uh, cleaner linear boundary where you can just use a single line or a, a hyperplane to just separate two different classes so this is like a more realistic uh, example i'm showing you on the left where the purple is like one uh, uh, one category and the blue one is the other category and as we were discussing uh, in the last lecture whatever straight line you uh, draw it will be very difficult for you uh, to separate these two classes so this is like one example where we have a straight line like this we have the support vectors as well but still you can see that we don't have a clean boundary so as a human we can we can easily see that okay if you just draw a circle around this then that curve will be able to separate these two but the question is how we do learn that uh, how do we learn that automatically and that's where support vector machine uh, comes into play so what we want is we want non linear boundaries all right so let's see how we can do that using uh, support vectors let's say we have a training uh, a set of training samples uh, something like this the blue dots are class 1 and the red dots are class 2 and the the uh, decision boundary will look something like this maybe a circle around the red uh, red dots all right now uh, this is the kernel trick which i was talking about and you will see that how we can easily use maybe a linear classifier to to separate these two classes the only thing we'll have to do is we'll have to project these points to a higher space a high dimensional space so this is two dimensional and what we can do is we can easily project that uh, all these points into a three dimensional space and to do that projection we will need some kind of function i will also give you a very uh, i think in, uh, intuitive example so this is 2d we can project uh, it to 3d and whatever this function is what it does is now this is a 3d space and you can see that the red points are around this region closer to the origin and all the blue points are far away from the origin so this function could be in this case it could be maybe just a a polynomial function right and even in this case you can easily observe that all these blue points are away from the origin right and in this case origin is like the center of maybe the circle which is the you can also say the center of this uh, red distribution over here so by projecting these points to 3d now what you can easily do is now you have moved from two dimensional space to three dimensional space but in this case you can easily create a 2d plane between these two set of points and again this is a linear boundary and that plane or that hyperplane will easily differentiate between <coughs> red points and blue points okay so let me actually uh a more interesting one i think probably i should add that figure into these slides <clears throat> so you can see my sketchboard no okay uh, all right uh, so let's say instead of 2d we have a we have a 1d space and let's say this is the origin and let me okay so 
the red points are class number one. Okay, so if, if you think about this, if you have uh, some class category, it doesn't matter like in which, what's the dimensionality of your space, right? If they belong to the same class, they will cluster together uh, in, a, in, a, in a tight group, right? Uh, a tight grouping, so it will be a distribution. And the only question is how to separate those different distributions. So in this case, it's a very simple case. It's just a linear line. And let's say we have another class, which is green, which are maybe clustered around here and then cluster around here. All right. So as I said, if you use a linear line, there is no way you can separate these two. Okay, so in whatever way you create a draw a line, you won't be able to separate this. But what we, what you can do is, so this is 1D. And next, what you can do is you can use a function. You can call the, this as a projection function. And this could be maybe y or psi of x is, let's say, you just square the numbers. All right, so then what will happen is, as you square, these uh, points will be projected uh let me change the color somewhere here right and maybe it will be a sharp curve similarly these will be projected over here and all the reds one will be projected like this right so this is a very simple function you just square it and then what you can do is you can easily draw a straight line and you can separate these two classes using a linear classifier okay so that's the kernel trick so and this is the kernel which you want to learn so i hope this was uh, clear let me go back to the slides and again this is the same thing but it's uh, trying to do uh, trying to move the points from 2d to 3d and that's the trick which we use and that's called svm Okay, so this is fine. We have seen this earlier. If we have a non-linear uh, boundary, we have a curve, something like this. So we try to learn these smaller kernels. And these kernels are again the projection functions. We project your data and then again use, uh, again use like those linear classifiers to separate those two. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind SVM. We are not going to go into detail how to actually uh, uh, how to derive those kernels because that's an optimization problem. But but I just told you the main intuition how how why, why it works and how it works. Now so that was differentiating between two classes and again it's it's just a binary classification, right? Now the question is what if we have uh, multi class SVMs? I think there was a question uh, earlier today in the I think Katrina yeah she asked like what if we have multiple classes? So even like your uh, your uh, SV classifier or your SVM, they can't be directly used for multiple classes. Okay, so we don't, I mean, SVM, this has been researched for decades, but still we don't have like a multi-class SVM. We just use a single uh, simple trick. We still train a two-class uh, SVM, and there are different variations how you can use this two-class SVM to solve your multiple class uh, classification problem. So one thing you can do is you can do a one versus others. So what this means is you, let's say you have 10 different classes. You take one of the class and that will be your class number one, your positive class, and you group together all the other classes. Let's say from uh, two, to, two to 10, right? So all those will be negative. And then you can easily train a binary classifier. And you do that for all the classes, all right? So that's one versus others. And you can also have uh, one versus one as well. You can maybe pick two and train for those two. And then you will have to train a lot of classifiers, all right? Depending depending upon the like uh, the combinations you have. Uh, so SVM, as I said, uh, one can uh, one can say that they delayed uh, the deep, deep learning boom, but still people use SVMs because they I mean, we have a lot of lot of implementations of these. They are very very efficient, very easy to train. All right, so. Publicly available SM packages are there in almost all the uh, your uh, computer vision softwares. The kernel trick, which we just discussed, it's it's very powerful. It can it can 
differentiate between two different classes even if like it's it's very complex because we don't have to like optimize and get a very complex function we just project it to a different space and then just use linear classifier okay so in practice even if you have very few samples it, it work, uh, works pretty well and that's like one use case where it uh, performs better than your deep learning architectures one issue is, as we just discussed, we don't have a direct multi-class SVM, so we'll have to combine multiple uh, two-class SVMs. And some of the areas, for example, if it's a medical field, most of the time it's a binary, uh, binary uh, classification, because, for example, you want to detect whether a tumor is present in that image or not, so things like that. Mostly it's like it's present or not, so binary. But in other like vision-related uh, issues, you can say like uh, autonomous driving or robotics, we, we don't have to deal with binary classification. Most of the time it's multiple classes and there uh, we don't have a straightforward, so, uh, straightforward solution uh, for SVMs. Okay. And uh, the computation memory is another issue. If you have very large scale data set, then training time is actually very longer for uh, SVMs and they work pretty well for smaller uh, training data sets. But as, as it goes uh, bigger, we have memory issues. And that's the benefit of deep learning. I mean, so I mean that you can say benefit as well, or uh, maybe a drawback because they need large number of samples to train. But again, if you have large number of samples, you can usually use those samples to train your network. Uh, yeah, so that was all about support vector machines and linear classifiers. Uh, I think there is a question from Daniel. Would kernel to perform well if one class is embedded in another? So as I said, I mean, that's like a corner case, right? Your classes will not be embedded with each. I mean, they're embedded, then it's, it's you, you can't say that they are two different classes. And you can say that you have clusters embedded within each other, then definitely it will work. And that was your question. Yeah, yeah, like if, yeah. You, if you plot it in like a 2D space, like mm. one is like r right on top of the other, pretty much. Right, right. Yeah, they will definitely work because then it will easily create like a kernel, which will transform that to a high, uh, high dimensional space and then you can separate. Okay, okay. So cool. that is, I think, a very uh, very interesting use case where SVMs are very powerful. Okay, so yeah, that's all for uh, support vectors. Any question? If not, then uh, we'll move on to the next lecture again, which is we'll, we'll cover that pretty quickly because as I said, most of this we have already covered in the previous lectures. It's basically uh, a repetition. So I will try to skim over the slides. Uh, let me start a new share. All right. So any other question you have? And let me know if you don't see my slides because I just switched them. Okay, so uh, so far we have seen uh, classification and those were classical approaches. Uh, we, we studied nearest neighbor, which was pretty simple. And you see, uh, it, it can be very powerful if your data set is uh, very simple. Then we talked about linear classifiers again, which was a very interesting topic. The next one is the, the case where we don't have to extract features, all right? Because all the other uh, algorithms, you first need to extract features and then use the classifiers. So in this case, and again, this is we, we are moving towards deep learning, where we will just use the architecture which, which can take your visual data as input and directly extract the features and perform the classification at the same time. And this has been like uh, discussed a lot in this course. Okay, so the problem, it's the same. We have to uh, differentiate between two different categories. And we, we call this as a machine learning framework and the network, we can say that it's a function which takes like uh, directly the image and it make predictions, which is something about like some prediction about the image, about the input image. Okay, and we need uh, a lot of training samples and for each training sample, we will need a, uh, need a label or we call that annotation, which indicates uh, something which you want to predict. So if you are doing, let's say, object uh, classification, we need object categories or uh, labels for objects, whether these objects are present in this particular sample or not. 
Okay, so that's like a very uh, uh, general concept. You have your training images. This is your uh, training pipeline. So we won't do image, uh, we won't extract feature images now. All of this will be end to end. We will need labels, which is fine. Okay, so we won't use image features. So that's fine. The different image features uh, we discussed. And this lecture is about learning features. Okay, so we'll learn features and use those features directly for classification. So the first step of classifier, which falls into that category is neural network, where uh, you have these inputs and you have these layers. So these are fully connected layers. And at the end, the network will make prediction. And of course you can use neural networks uh, for pre-extracted features as well. It doesn't have to be input image, okay? So you can, you can actually use HOG feature extractor or something extract the features from the images and then train a linear classifier on top of that. That's also totally possible. Now, this is more interesting, which is, you can say a kind of upgrade of neural networks because you have a neural network at the end over here where you, where you use fully connected layers. And I think you have seen this in your programming assignment as well. So these uh, fully connected layers, neural network makes a prediction. But before this, you have this full architecture or you can say like your network which tries to extract features from this input image. So this is your uh, convolution operation in each layer and some other layers. So it's a combination of uh, those. Okay, so I think this is fine neural network. Uh, this is just a recap. Okay, so let, let's uh, briefly go over this LXNet, which uh, again, we have discussed earlier. So this LXNet architecture was used for classification problem. And the idea there was given an input image, you have to predict which object category is present in this input image or not. So that's a classification problem. And this was like, you can say one of the first uh, deep architectures, which was used successfully on large scale data sets. And this classifier, for, classifier was used for thousand different classes. And that's the reason this network is making predictions, like a thousand different predictions. And if you if you compare this with SVM, where it will be very difficult to actually train a linear classifier for a thousand different classes because you have to train that many classifiers. So one for each category. All right. So but in this case, you just have one network for all the classes. And that will make all the predictions. So that's that's a big difference. So yeah, I think this is fine. We don't have to talk uh, talk about this in more detail because I think we have covered uh, this already. Now, one interesting uh, aspect which I want to discuss is the idea of completely fully convolutional neural network. So in this case, if you if you uh, carefully look at this, you have the image, you have your CNN architecture, but at the end, what you do is you do add these dense layers which are like fully connected layers to make the prediction and uh, when you define these dense layers then in a way you're restricting like how many kernels you are using let's say 4096 and the number of parameters you will have that will depend upon the size of your this uh, the previous activation map right you have, you have so, uh, solved that question uh, a lot now if you think about this Let's say we train this kind of network on a resolution of two to four by two to four. Okay. Then what will happen is during testing, if you will, if you have to send in, let's say a, a bigger resolution image, then this architecture will not work because if you increase the resolution, then the size of this feature map will also change. It will also increase. Right. And if it increases, then the number of parameters you need to convert this to the, uh, these, uh, this, uh, these, uh, activation maps or these activation points to the, uh, dense layer, they will change. And then you will not be able to use like exactly those weights for moving from this activation layer to this uh, dense layer. So to use such a network, you will always have to resize your input image to two to four by two to four. All right, so that, that's one restriction and that's where uh, fully convolutional layer, you can say in one way, not exactly, but they, they come in handy 
where we don't use these dense layers okay and one might also say i mean it's just like a different representation and uh essentially we are using dense layers so let, let's first talk about those fully convolutional network okay so first of all we don't need any feature flattening and probably from my point of view that's the only difference all the other points you will see that uh more or less they are similar so no feature flattening no fully connected layers it's fully convolutional so the trick is what you can do is you can reduce your spatial dimension to one cross one all right so and once you have your one cross one feature uh, feature map you can use a one cross one convolution on top of this to make the prediction all right and if, if you think about this more carefully your one cross one convolution is same as your fully connected layer because what your one cross one convolution does is it will be just one number first of all and then depending upon the depth of your input feature map you will have that many values in the kernel and the way convolution works is you have to compute a linear combination of all those values which is exactly what fully connected layer does okay so that's why i mean functionality wise it's it's not very different now let's see how this can be done so let's say you have uh, an input image 14 cross 14 cross 3 so three channels the third dimension is channel and this is an rgb image pretty small and you are using let's say 5 cross 5 kernel so now you can get these numbers it should be easy for you then max pooling then you flatten this and computer and add a fully connected layer and this layer has 400 different neurons all right you can add one more fully connected layer for the neurons and then you can have one more to make the prediction so in this case you have four different classes okay so this is like your traditional convolutional network where you have convolutional layers followed by fully connected layers now let's see if we can convert this architecture to a fully convolutional one where we will not need these fully connected layers so you have the same input which is fine same kernel same activation map right now from this point onwards what we can do is instead of using a fully connected layer we can use a com kernel which is five cross five and since this is five cross five it will reduce the resolution to just one cross one okay so this is one way of doing this and 400 is just like you are using 400 different kernels all right so now this is if you think about this this is again just 400 numbers the only difference is how you obtain these and this is like similar to these 400 numbers but in on top of this what you can do is you can again use like a one cross one kernel again four different kernels and then again one cross one kernel to make four predictions so in this one you don't need any fully connected layer this is all convolutional all right so i think we have a pop quiz on this any questions before we move on to that all right so i think it's the same architecture this is like uh, the one which is using fully connected layers and it's solving the same problem given an image of this resolution it predicts four different values and the second one is a fully convolutional one again same input 14 cross 14 cross 3 and again it's making four uh, prediction of four different values so the question is which one of these two networks will have fewer parameters so the top one which is fc fully connected layer the con one which is the bottom one or they will have same number of parameters
Okay, sorry, my mic was on mute. I think there were some questions in between. I will uh, go over those. So the answer will be C, uh, it will be similar. Let me quickly explain why. So in this one, if you think about this, until this point, both will have same number of parameters, right? The only difference is this point onwards. And if you, let, let's uh, walk backwards. So this one will have 400 times four uh, parameters, right? And if you compare with this, again, you have 400 parameters uh, here and 400 different kernels. And this is four. So this layer will also have 400 times four parameters, right? Because you are using four different kernels and for each kernel, the depth will be 400. And same will be true for this. You're using 400 different kernels. It's fine, it, ha it has just one value. And it, the depth of that, those kernels will be 400 because of the depth of this activation map. So the number of parameters here again will be 400 cross 400. And that's almost similar to this because you're connecting these two. So this is 400 times 400. The tricky part is like this layer, but again, it will be similar if you think about this because <clears throat> if you convert, if you flatten these features, you will get five times five times 16 different values. So number of parameters here will be this times 400 and which is exactly the same in the bottom network because you're using five cross five kernel but the depth of these kernels should be 16 right because of the depth of this uh, activation map so which means that the number of parameters for one kernel is five cross five cross 16 and you need 400 such kernels to generate uh, this activation map which is exactly the same as this one okay so which means like it will have a uh, both will have same uh, number of parameters. Let me quickly go over the questions. Um, question from Austin, where can we get lecture slides? Lecture slides are on web courses. And I also shared like on the chat because some students complain like web courses were not active. Austin, let me know if, you, if you're not able to find the slides. Question from Arushia, what is the advantage of the fully convolutional network over fully connected layers? So it depends like how you are using it. And uh, one of the, I think the, the, the I will say the uh, best advantage or the, the, the best use case is when you want to develop a network which is invariant of the input size. Right, and for example, if you want to solve a, if you want to solve a segmentation problem, right? So for segmentation, you have an input image, and for each pixel, you want to make some prediction. Now, if your network is fully convolutional, then it doesn't matter like what's the resolution of your input image. You can keep changing that; you will still be able to use the same network. Okay, so it's just like your the the shape of your activation maps will grow in. Um, grow and shrink but the number of you, you will still be able to use the same kernels because you share those kernels across uh, across space so that's the biggest advantage uh let me see i think there was one more question question from mud does cnn have weights yes mud cnn does have weights so the kernels for cnn you need kernels right and those kernel values are, are the weights because the, those values are something which you will learn when you train your network. Okay. Question from Amelia. Uh, I have a question not related to this question. For applying say the five cross five kernel 400 times, is it the same kernel each time or do we use different five cross five kernels? Yeah, if it's 400 times, it means like you have 400 different kernels. So that's the main idea, right? You can use different kernels in the same layer, which means you're trying to, you're trying to perform pattern matching for all those kernels. So you can match all those patterns at the same step or, or, the, or the same level of your uh, computation, right? So that's, that's the power of uh, CNN. So that's good. And so that's one thing, having different kernels. And the other is you, you share those kernels across space. 
So you apply the same kernel at different locations. I think those were all the questions. Okay, question from Fernando. Wouldn't the FC use an extra one for the bias? Yeah, bias, let, let's ignore that. I mean, you can have bias in CNNs as well, right? So, I mean, if you want, you can have, you can have bias in, in CNN as well. So that's fine, but yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Okay, question from Joy. When you increase the resolution of the input, you may get a two cross two cross four output. If you were classifying that image, would you just take the majority vote? Yeah, so that's that's a good question, Joey. And that's why I said, like, depending upon which problem you are solving. So this is classification, and fully convolution might not be very uh, appropriate for maybe this problem. But I mean, for some problems, it could be for some cases. But as I said, segmentation is a very good use case because segmentation, what you want is you want prediction for each pixel location, right? So if your if your image resolution is increasing, then your output resolution should also increase. And that's what will happen if you have a fully convolutional neural network. It will allow you, allow you to do that, okay? So in this case, uh, you are right. If you increase the resolution of input image, your output will increase. But the interesting thing is it won't give you any error. You will still be able to use the network. And it's fine, I mean, you are saying that you can use a majority vote that that that's also done you can do some kind of pooling okay so all of all of those are fine so question from what what would be the benefit of converting our fc to cnn i just told that uh, for some problems it's very useful because that's that allows you to like have a flexible uh, image resolution Question from Mehdi, is the number of parameters in convolution this? Number of parameters. <clears throat> so Mehdi, I'm not sure what, what your question is. Can you, can you please rephrase it? Okay, from then, will the bias changes the answer? We could have a bias per layer or per kernel or, yeah, but you can, you can do the same, all the variations on both networks, right? So, Brandon missed the answer. Yeah, the answer was C. Okay, question from George. Why don't we use a fully con layer in normal classification then? Is there accuracy loss in normal classification if you use? No, there is no accuracy loss. Even mean if you if you, if you will see like the recent architectures they do most of them are like fully convolutional we don't use like fully connected layers uh, normally so there is no classification loss as i said like functionality wise they are doing the same operations it's, it's not changing okay all right so i think i covered all the questions if i missed any or uh, just let me know and then we can move forward. Okay, so as I said, like uh, as I said, uh, the I think the only uh, important concept left is softmax, and most of this is uh, revision. So I will quickly go over the slides, but uh, stop me if you have any question. So then the idea was into uh, introduction of nonlinearities, and we we discussed this earlier why we need that. Because if we don't have nonlinearities in our network, then basically it's just one layer. We can just compress it all, and it's it will be equivalent to like a single layer. Then we don't need a deeper network. And these activation functions, which introduce nonlinearity, actually allow us to learn very complex functions. Okay, so we apply these activations after each uh, convolutional layers or fully connected layers, and <clears throat> these are like some of the examples we have sigmoid. You have used this, we have Tanach and Relu. So these activations are not only useful to make the network non-linear, but sometimes they are also used to make the correct type of prediction by your network and make it easier for, for the network to actually uh, to make those predictions. So I will give you some use cases. For example, 
for example, if you are doing classification, right, then classification means you want maybe uh, some kind of probability for each uh, each category, each class category, and probability is usually between zero and one. So then using sigmoid as an activation after your final layer makes sense because it will give you a number between zero and one, and you can directly use that as probability. Okay. Then tan h is negative one and one. If you don't want to use tan h like for a classification because it will be hard to interpret uh, the values. Or like, of course you can do it, but it's it's not a very nice way to do it. Again, if you if you have to use ReLU, it could be problematic because you might get some values which are too huge and some values which are very small. Again, you will be you will find it difficult to actually uh, interpret those values. For example, if your prediction says let's say a number one or two, and then let's say another number says one one thousand, so then how do you interpret? Are they equal or are they different? So that's why for classification you can use sigmoid. Okay, so that's another use of, this is fine. And uh, so binary classification, we saw uh, when we were talking about linear classification, we, we can try, we can solve this in uh, two different forms here when you're using a deep network. We can just make one prediction and that prediction will tell you whether the class is present or not. For example, what you can do is, you can use a sigmoid activation uh, after the final layer and your network is just predicting one value. So that value could be between zero and one. And what you can do is you can say that, okay, if it's zero, it's one class. If it's close to one, it's another class. So you can just use one value to make binary, uh, like two class predictions. The other way will be, you can make two outputs, right? And you can just then assign one output to one class and the other output to the other class. So one of them can be negative, which will say that, okay, if this is active, this class is not present. And then the other output will say, if this is highly active, the class is present. So you just assign uh, uh, those two as positives and negatives. And again, these two variations, uh, in terms of performance, it won't matter much. Most of the time it performs, uh, both, both performs like equally well. It's just like variation. And multi-class, again, you can just have uh, multiple predictions. Now, <clears throat> this is interesting, the second concept, which is called softmix. And uh, what it does is when you make mul multiple predictions, and if it's a classification problem, you will uh, use a sigmoid, uh, you can use a sigmoid uh, activation, right? And then all of these values will be between zero and one. But what might happen is, your network might predict a high probability for multiple classes. Let's say it's saying this class is present, so this will be close to one. And it could say this class is present, it could be close to one, all right? So sigmoid is not uh, taking care of that. And in that case, you will be confused, okay, then which class is present because your network is confused. So then in those cases, softmax uh, is a very good solution. It's, it's an activation function. What it does is, given a set of numbers, it tries to turn them into probabilities and it will make sure that one of the class is highly active and the others are not that much active. All right. So let's see how it uh, does that. For example, if your network is making prediction, let's say you have three different classes. You have cat, car, and frog, and your network predicts uh, 3.2, 5.1, negative 1.7. So we can say that, okay, this is a bad prediction because actually cat was present but your network is saying car was present with a like high confidence it's 5.1 and frog is negative but again I mean you can you can judge that network is not doing well but to estimate how bad it is doing you will have to convert these numbers to probabilities all right and uh, the way to do that is uh, use a softmax function so this is the softmax formulation and in this case your numerator is like exponent of the predicted value, what the network is predicting. And in the bottom, you are just summing up all the predictions or uh, exponent of all the predictions. Okay, so let, let's let's walk through this. So we first of all, we need exponent of all the predictions. So that's the first step. And these are all the predictions. You just take exp uh, exponential of these numbers. So you will get 24.5 for this, 164 and 0.18 for this. So 
all the negative values are also becoming positive okay so these numbers are these exponents here and again the summation of the de denominator is like if you sum all these values that will be the denominator and the denominator is used to normalize uh, the values to give you the probability now what you do is you sum all these numbers which will give you one number and then for each prediction you normalize using that summation and once you do that you get these numbers and these are the actual probabilities and if you think about this if you just sum these up it will always be equal to one so in this case this is zero 87 and 13 right so this sum, sums up to one so this was three class classification even if you have thousand class classification even then this function will turn the predictions to probabilities and if you just sum all those uh, if you just sum uh, all those probabilities it will be equal to one okay so that's how <clears throat> that's how you turn uh, the network's prediction to probabilities and that's why when you're doing classification you use a softmax activation after the final layer and i think in mo most of the platforms even in pytorch if you're using a cross entropy loss then the softmax function is automatically there you don't have to uh, write it separately but it does this internally first converts uh, convert these numbers to probabilities and then compute the loss function and here you can you can see that it's it's very easy to interpret this so the network is saying like the, uh, a car is present in this image with a probability of 87 which is which is very high and it's saying like 13 percent uh, with a probability of 13 percent it's a it's a cat so it's a very bad prediction but in this case it wasn't very clear because these are like close numbers like three and five and this is in fact negative so i think there is a question uh, Okay, George, we covered that. Could you please explain why the normal activation functions will not work? Is it to turn into probabilities? Yes, uh, Zubin. So the first idea is to turn it into probabilities so that it has a better interpretation. And then we can use these uh, probabilities to, to compute, the, compute the loss. And that would be used to train the network. And why the other normal activation will not work let's say if you have a if you have a sigmoid right sigmoid will independently be applied on these predictions so the sigmoid will convert this between zero and one and this between zero and one this between zero and one but it won't look into like predictions from other classes so it's not actually uh, finding that correlation so whatever number it gives you they will not be probabilities so it may happen that you get uh let's say 57 percent for cat and 87 for car and if you if you sum those up that will not be one it will be greater than one so those are not probabilities okay good so <clears throat> so yeah that was the uh, uh, i think main idea uh and this is used like for all the classification problems by default now, if you have a multi-label problem, so multi-label is slightly different. So don't confuse between multi-label and multi-class. Multi-classes, you have multiple classes. Multi-label is you can have multiple labels present in a single sample, and still it will be multiple class. So for example, if you have an image of a digit, right? So you can, if you can only have one digit uh, per sample or per image, and you have 10 different classes, then that's multi-class. But if you can have multiple digits in one image, for example, let's say a data set for street, uh, street numbers, right? So street numbers might have multiple digits in one image. So that's multi-label. So in case of multi-label, your network should predict multiple classes as, uh, as active in the, in, this, in the same sample. So in that case, softmax will not work. And the reason it won't work is because of this uh, formulation it will try to make one of the prediction highly active and the, it will try to suppress the other predictions. And in case of multi-label, we don't want that because we can have multiple classes which are present. Okay, so then what we do is we directly use a sigmoid activation. And in that case, we can have, we can have multiple predictions as active. So a uh, question from Shah, is it okay to treat a binary classifier as a two class classifier and use softmax as activation? Yeah, that's that's true. That's exactly what, what we do. 
if you are solving a binary classification as a two class problem, then you will have to have a softmax. If you just use sigmoid, then it might say both predictions as active and then you'll be confused because it will be saying that, okay, the class is present and it will also be saying the class is not present. So you definitely need a softmax there. And that's a very good use case for softmax. Okay, so that's a good point. And so for multi-level, you just use sigmoid and your multiple uh, predictions can be active. And then finally, uh, the loss function, uh, I think you already know this, you need a loss function to determine how good your network is doing. Okay, for, each, for, for that, you need a ground truth and you need some kind of formulation which compares the network's prediction with the ground truth and it tells you whether the prediction is good or not. And based on that prediction, you, you train your network. So that's the standard process. And this cross entropy, I think we have discussed this earlier. Uh, I think we also discussed the intuition why uh, this is a good loss function. And let me briefly go over that again. So if you have a positive sample, it means that you want to say that sample is present. So you should be predicting values which are close to one. So let's carefully look at the plot. So this plot is, uh, this plot is coming uh, from this cross entropy. All right, so you can see that if it's one, your network is saying one, the loss is actually zero, which is good because I mean, the class is present, your network is saying one, so we are happy, the loss is zero. And if you decrease the confidence of your network, so it's going towards zero, then you can see that as it goes to close to zero, it's going to infinity. And this plot is, as I said, it's coming directly out from this uh, formulation and we have discussed this earlier. So then you can say that if the network is making wrong prediction, then the loss is actually increasing. And if it's very close to zero, the loss is actually close to infinity, which is the right, uh, which is the uh, right thing to do, right? Okay, so question from Shra, why can't we consider two, three top probabilities from softmax in case of multiple labels? Yeah, because softmax is trying to make just one of them active and it's trying to suppress all the others. And of course you can do that, but that's not a good strategy and it, it won't work that well. That, that was the main idea behind softmax. So whatever numbers you get, you push the maximum number close to one and all the other numbers close to zero. So if you, that's why I showed you this concrete example, right? If you carefully look at this, so these numbers, uh, this is 3.2 and this is 5.1, right? So if you don't apply softmax, then this is kind of saying that both are positive, right? And they are greater than zero and this is negative. So if you don't have, if you're not seeing this image, just hide this one. And you just look at the network prediction. What will you say? You will say that, okay, both cat and car are present because they are pretty close to each other. But after applying softmax, if I show you these numbers, then you will be very confident uh, and you'll see that, okay, probably cat is not present, car is present because it's trying to push one of the predictions to close to one. Is it clear, sir? Okay, good. And that's actually, uh, I mean, it's, it's not just interpretation. It also helps the network train well because then what will happen is the network is making confident predictions. Either it's saying it's present or it's saying it's not present. It's not like in the borderline area. And if that happens, then either the prediction will be good, so network will be happy, or it will be bad. And if it will be bad, it will be very bad, right? Because 87% and zero, they're pretty far away. So then it will like uh, turn into a very high loss and then that will help in training the network. So that's, that's the whole idea, like why softmax actually is used for, uh, uh, for single class, uh, if you have, uh, uh, single class active. Okay. So let me quickly. Okay. So that was the loss function and this is good. And then once you have the loss function, you just train it. So gradient descent is like the standard uh, optimization, which we have learned. And there are different various variations actually. So you can use SGD, which is stochastic gradient de descent. Then we have Adam optimizer. In this case, you use, uh, uh adaptive momentum. That's the short form, like, uh, and then you have error delta, which is quite interesting. Error delta, you, you don't have to actually, uh, you don't have to tell the learning rate. This optimizer automatically finds a good learning rate. So, which, which is quite interesting.
but again this is like an ongoing research so we don't know which one is better which one is not for some of the data sets one will perform better than other and in most of the cases i think adam is widely used and if if you have a huge data set and you don't worry about like longer convergence time then sgd is used okay and this is also fine i think uh, we have covered that uh, when you train your network you basically monitor two kind of uh, plots one is for uh, test data or validation data the other is for training so you can monitor the loss value it should go down and both losses should do, go down actually both uh, testing and training and if you're monitoring the accuracy then again your accuracy should increase for both uh, training and testing And these visualizations, we have done these before. Uh, let me quickly go over these. Uh, so your initial layers in your CNN tries to learn very simple basic patterns. These could be edges or maybe colors. And as you move deeper into a network, your kernels try to learn more complex uh, patterns. And as you are just before your classifier, then you can see here that I mean you might see like the complete objects itself. So there's like, uh, Com, uh, com shaped object right so there's a peacock you can see, see so all these are fully formed objects so at this level i mean your kernels are actually directly getting activated if the particular object is present or not so it's getting complicated and complicated as you move deeper into your network so that was i think all about uh classification using deep networks and as i said like uh there were only a couple of new concepts which we covered so any any questions Yeah, that's a good question, Daniel. Uh, how heavy? So, question is, how heavy does the CS community rely on mathematicians with their global optimization research? Uh, we we do rely, and uh, there are like a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is, I mean, although these deep networks are working pretty well, but most of the time, I mean, we can't interpret, we can't say why it's working well. Okay, so therefore, we need their help to actually explain it to us why it's working and again that's i mean you can say that's interpretable ai and again uh, an ongoing research area so it's it's an ongoing research a very interesting research area and researchers from both cs community and mathematicians are trying to work on that and if, if you think about this like most of these basics like the optimization and this convolution it's, it's coming from mathematics background right it's a different story that it's uh, uh, it's working pretty well for computer vision, but all of this is coming from mathematics background. So if you are if you are if you want to be a mathematician and you are interested into like theory kind of work, I think right now it's it's uh, it's in very high high demand. And there's a lot to be explored, a lot to be figured out. So if you want to jump into that area, I think now is the right time. Okay, so I think we can we can uh, <clears throat> uh, wrap it up today early and that's fine. Next time we will start with object detection. That's a fresh uh, topic. So uh, it seems there are no other questions. That's good. And if you have any other questions, uh, just, just let me know. And I think grades were released. So if you have any question regarding grading as well, uh, just let me know. Some of you have contacted already, so that's good. But if you see any issue in your grading and you want to know more, just, just let us know. We can discuss it further, okay? All right, then uh, let's end it here. Thank you, bye. So yeah, Sayed, I'm not sure because web courses, it's working for me and it's working from some of, uh, working for some of the other students. Okay, so it could be maybe VPN as some, uh, the other student was saying, or it could be like specifically your account. Okay, question from uh, midterm grade capped. No, it wasn't capped at 20. So if you have done bonus, they will be like on top of 20. Okay. Okay.
Okay, question from Fatima Jal. Pop quizzes are extra credit. They are not part of the grade. Yes, they will count towards final grade ratio. Okay, all right. Uh, I think we can end it here.